Good morning and welcome to this, the ninth meeting of 2014 of the European and External Relations Committee. I'm going to make the usual, usual request that mobile phones are switched off. Um, we have no apologies at present. Everyone's present and correct. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Um, so I'm seeking members' agreement to take um, items four and five in private as normal procedure. Jimmy. Um, since the correspondence referred to is already in the public domain, is it really necessary to take item four in private? The, the usual procedure is to take any correspondence in private to allow members to have um, a frank and open discussion about the correspondence, and I think that the correspondence doesn't actually answer any of the questions. So we quite Can we not like have a frank, open discussion in public? The usual procedure, Jamie, is to take any correspondence in private. We did the same with the Deputy okay. First Minister as well. Just making a point. Yeah, OK. Chair, can I, can I also say that whilst I wasn't here at the previous meeting where item number six was agreed to take in private, can, could I just emphasise the fact that we'll be taking that in private as well? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. It's usual procedure. OK, to go forward with items four, five and six in private. Please. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is continuation of an inquiry um, uh, and it's the main agenda item today and we are looking at the Scottish Government's proposal for an independent Scotland in the European Union um, and today we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary. Welcome Cabinet Secretary um, Fiona Hislop for Culture and External Affairs and you have two of your officials with you today. Um, Russell Bain, who is External Affairs Policy Manager, and Colin Emery, the Deputy Director and Head of Europe and UK Relations. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I don't know if you've got a brief opening statement, and then we'll go straight briefly, to questions. Yeah, yeah. Very briefly. Okay, yeah. Thank, thank you. And uh, I'm grateful for the committee for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I uh, look forward to answering your questions, and also thank you for accommodating me time-wise. I have to leave to go to the airport and government business, so thank you very much for uh, agreeing to the, the time. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the committee for conducting a very thorough inquiry. Uh, the quality of the contributions has meant that this inquiry has produced a, a wealth of valuable and informative material which may otherwise have been lost in the overall debate about Scotland's place and role in the European Union. Uh, when the Deputy First Minister uh, gave evidence at the start of the inquiry process, she highlighted the opportunity presented by independents to put Scotland's interests first at all times. She noted the ability that independent Scotland would have to participate in the international community and highlighted the importance of the European Union as a key international institution. And what the committee's inquiry has done is to demonstrate the consensus that has grown around the concepts that are set out in Scotland's future. The consensus that an independent Scotland would become a member of the EU and the acknowledgement of the need to have practical solutions to avoid the absurd situation situation of Scotland being outside the Union. The word absurd was, of course, referred to by uh, Sir David Edward in his evidence to you. Uh, expert witnesses have appeared before the committee and through their evidence have dismantled some of the more extreme positions taken by those who oppose independence and the content of Scotland's uh, future, the white, white paper. Those that have sought to portray the route to membership as difficult, if not impossible, have been shown to be scaremongering. The Scottish Government has noted the focus in this inquiry on issues raised with respect to the terms of membership for an independent Scotland. Issue, issues such as the Euro, Schengen and the UK rebate have all been discussed. Uh, my assessment of these discussions is that the common sense view put forward by the Scottish Government is recognised as a practical and pragmatic way to address these issues. Uh, when the committee has looked at the opportunities and challenges that are associated with independent membership of the EU for countries the size of Scotland, they've heard about the positive um, experience of Ireland. And this chimes with the vision set out by the, the government, both in Scotland's future and our paper um, on Scotland in the European Union. The committee is aware that this government is committed to strengthening Scotland's voice in Europe, aiming to ensure that Scotland's interests are fully represented at the European level, while making clear the rest of Europe uh, the wealth of experience and resources Scotland has to offer as a nation. And as we've also been clear that there is a need for reform of the EU, and in February this year we set out priorities for reform, which include putting greater weight uh, on collective policy and funding initiatives where binding EU legislation might not be the most effective or appropriate way of addressing an issue. Uh, they also uh, include ensuring that greater adherence is paid to the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality in developing proposed EU legislation. I know the committee has taken a keen interest in that aspect in particular. Uh, we'd also like to see greater use of directives rather than regulations where comprehensive harmonisation of the laws of the member states is not absolutely necessary. 
and we would welcome enhanced consultation on proposals uh, for legislation with the conducting of more detailed impact assessments, including at those stages in the legislative process at which significant amendments to legislative uh, proposals are being made. And what this demonstrates is our commitment, our readiness to engage with the EU as a full independent member. Uh, this committee inquiry has heard that countries the size of Scotland thrive within the EU and are well placed to make valuable contributions to its future. Uh, following a vote for independence in September, this government will work constructively with the UK government as set out in the Edinburgh Agreement and this will include the work necessary to ensure Scotland's continuing membership of the EU. Uh, this government remains firmly of the view that the biggest threat to Scotland's membership of the European Union is the Prime Minister's proposed in-out referendum scheduled for 2017 and we hope that the rest of the UK would choose to stay in if ever faced with that choice. And we consider that the new relationship between an independent Scotland and the UK would mean that we could together form a strong partnership for action when our interests coincided in Europe. Importantly, however, where Scottish interests differed from those of the rest of the UK, we'd be free to make our own choices and pursue our own goals. And this approach, pursued in the EU and the wider international community, would see us in a stronger position than we could ever achieve under the present devolution settlement working together with two strong voices when it was the correct decision for Scotland, but able to take a different path when that was right for the pursuit of Scottish interests and values. So I don't want to say anything uh, further in terms of introduction. Um, I'm sure the committee has a wide range of questions. And again, I'd like to thank the committee again uh, for the opportunity to make the remarks. And I'm happy to answer uh, questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'll open myself and go to open questions from my colleagues. One of the, the, the key themes that came out during the inquiry is this issue about a hiatus between 2014 and 2016. And, and one of the concerns around about that is, would we be in, would we be out, you know, where, where would we sit? But another key concern was, if that hiatus is allowed uh, to be created, the impact that then has on EU citizens working, living and studying in Scotland, and Scottish citizens working or living or studying in Europe. Europe, and I was wondering if you could maybe give us some insight into your thoughts on that one. Okay. Well, I think it's in everybody's interest to make sure that we have a smooth transition as possible. I think it's in the interest not only of Scotland, but the rest of the UK and indeed um, our friends in the rest of the European Union. Um, obviously, at the point of the vote for independence on September the 19th, uh, Scotland will still be part of the United Kingdom until such time as the date of the legal independence, which would be uh, March 24th in 2016. Now, that provides a, a period, a very important period, um, for... Uh, the transition to be rolled out for the uh, initiation of the discussions, negotiation with the UK and indeed with, uh, with other uh, partners as well. We think, as has been recognised by a number of your witnesses, that's a, a reasonable timescale that that can be achieved. It also makes sense to ensure that smooth transition, which is in the interest of everybody. And I think that's an important point. And I recognise and you know, there will be campaigns taking place, but I think the responsibility of government and indeed I think the committee is to think through the practicalities, to think through the you know, the, 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 the common sense uh, practical solutions of what would be required during that period. And although governments uh, in campaign mode uh, will certainly be vociferous in setting out their points, and I recognise the UK government will do that, and indeed the Scottish government will do likewise. Uh, I think it's the responsibility for everyone to set out the process and procedures that can take place, and that's what we've set out particularly in Chapter 6 of uh, Scotland's future, but also in the accompanying paper, which I know this committee will be particularly interested in Scotland and the European Union. So it, th there's no need for uh, hiatus. Actually, what we're setting out is the reverse of that, is actually a smooth transition period, and it would start on September the 19th in terms of the discussions, but it would clearly uh, be implemented uh, by uh, you know, March 2016. Do you think, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that where there's um, that concern about a hiatus and, and some of the concerns that we've had from business and other uh, um, bodies, that it would be incumbent on anybody in, that's in this UK government at the time to, to start those negotiations immediately? Well, I, I agree with the evidence that was put forward by Sir David Edward. Uh, obviously, he's a former European Court of Justice uh, judge. I thought it was interesting in February that uh, Commission Vice President Vivian Redding described uh, Sir David Edward as a true architect um, of the European Union as recently as February. Um, 
I understand his uh, point where he said the simple fact is that there will be a gap between a vote for independence and the moment of separation. And my point is that during that period, there will be an obligation to negotiate a solution that does not lead to the absurd result that is being suggested. Now, that obligation is not just for the United Kingdom, as he sets out, but it's actually of other member states in that period. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means they have an obligation to Scots, the citizens of the European Union, from September 19th. Um, until that March 2016 period, that the obligation resides not just for the United Kingdom, but other member states. Now, what is the, the obligation? That is to ensure that there is a, a smooth uh, transition and that they would act in the interests um, of the Scottish people as European citizens uh, during that period. And I think that's a very important point. It also reflects the Edinburgh Agreement, where, uh, again, uh, you'll have heard evidence as well about the importance of the Edinburgh Agreement, and uh, you know, particularly Clause 30 within that, where the United Kingdom um, and, indeed, the Scottish Government has said, after the result of the referendum, both governments would work in the interests of the, of the Scottish people. That doesn't mean starting in March 2016. That means starting this year, on September 19th, should there be a yes vote. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Will I, do you want supplementary on that, Rod Campbell? Secretary, um, you read that quote for David Edward, which I also put to um, Alistair Carmichael. Um, Alistair Carmichael then seemed to kind of dodge issues as to what was to happen uh, after a yes vote in September um, by suggesting, when I said, well, there would surely be some negotiations, he said, first of all, that there would need to be negotiations as part of bilateral negotiations between Scotland and the UK before anything could be done with regard to the European Union. Uh, and then, uh, although he accepted that David Cameron had indicated he would support Scotland's membership of the European Union, he said that would be on the basis of uh, Cameron being Prime Minister of the uh, United Kingdom that would not include Scotland, um, and therefore he wouldn't be in a position to influence it. So he rather glossed over any question of participation in negotiations. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I, I, I'm sure um, Alistair Michael um, can speak for, him, for himself, uh, but... I think the point that David Cameron made about that he would support Scotland's membership of the European Union is actually quite an important, is an important point and reflects the Edinburgh Agreement. And although, um, and uh, Jamie McGregor perhaps aside, uh, there's a large number of people in Scotland who would not want to see uh, David Cameron as Prime Minister. Actually, he will be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, including Scotland, until the date of Scottish independence. So, therefore, his responsibility um, in terms of his obligations will extend to the interests of the Scottish people at that time in relation to the Edinburgh Agreement and also uh, his obligations more generally. So, I think that is a, a, an important uh, point that people have to act responsibly. And remember whose interest this is in as well. Um, it's in the economic, social, political political interests of everyone to make sure that there is that uh, smooth transition, not just to Scotland, but also our trading partners elsewhere. Um, and so therefore it's really important that that, that that kind of point is made. And I think that transition period of 18 months is something that has to be emphasised. And sometimes people, understandably, are still not aware that that differentiation exists. And so therefore, I think in terms of um, mm -hmm. Alistair Carmichael's comments on that, I think he, he, he would prefer, I suspect, to take the position where nothing happens until March 2016, and that uh, in terms of where the UK is coming from, what they're arguing is that, uh, that Scotland would not be a successful state, where quite clearly we think that it will be, as well as the United Kingdom, and that's a point of differentiation in terms of where they are in terms of the legal advice. But the UK government has also been contradictory, uh, because uh, David Mundell uh, has also, I think, indicated in some of the comments that he's made that he doesn't you know, respect that position um, of uh, the importance of recognising the role of Scotland um, as part of the initial act of union, for example. And I think it was interesting to read um, Ian Campbell's evidence to the committee, which goes through some of those more kind of fundamental constitutional questions that lie at the heart of this as well. Thank you. Molly Coffey. Thanks very much, <coughs> convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'd just like to thank my colleague Rod Campbell for, for honing in on an important issue and part of the evidence that the Secretary of State gave and which several <coughs> of the members of this committee asked him. I mean, that, that whole notion that uh, somehow after September the 18th, after a yes vote, that the United Kingdom and Mr Carmichael in particular uh, seemed to absolve himself from any responsibility on behalf of Scotland seemed quite astounding to me. And uh, I tried my best to press him on that several times, I think, to emphasise many of the points that you've just made, Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary. So in terms of the kind of legal duties and obligations and the Edinburgh Agreement, 
Is it quite clear in the Scottish Government's mind that the UK does have that continuing responsibility to represent our interests up until Independence Day in March 16? Yes. Super. In, in terms of the Article 48, uh, Article 49 issue, right through the course of this inquiry at the committee, I've asked anyone who has the view that tended towards Article 49 to explain to me by which article or by, by which clause uh, within the Treaty of Unions that demonstrates or the mechanism by which Scotland shall leave the European Union during that period. And, and to date, no one has been able to explain that to me. Uh, Mr Carmichael's best attempt appeared to be on record that Scotland's name doesn't appear on the treaty, so therefore we're not part of the, the game at that point. It's, it's almost as if if our name isn't on the tin, then we're not, we're not in it. I, mean, I find that quite a kind of incredibly schoolboy level analysis of the actual reality of the situation. And you could perhaps argue that if Scotland's name isn't on the national debt either, then it also doesn't belong to, to Scotland. But we could debate that. What's your view on that, on that particular contribution that the Secretary of State made, that Scotland's name not being on the treaty therefore means that we're outside well, uh, first of all, uh, and as, as I think the committee acknowledges and everybody acknowledges, this, this situation is unprecedented, right? So therefore, what will have to evolve is a, a discussion polit at political level as well, negotiation where uh, there's a political will, there will be a way. Now, the European Union are past masters at this. It's happened on a number of occasions um, and in terms of how they can uh, make sure that... Uh, the, the common sense prevails and we can uh, have the process that makes sense for everyone and in mutual self-interest. But in relation, to the, in relation to your point about what treaty therefore exists for 5 million European citizens to suddenly go from day one being part of the European Union to day two being not part of the European Union, not only is it absurd, but also I think uh, you know, there's a real question um, uh, about, again, one, the responsibility of the Secretary of State you know, in terms of what he would do in that 18-month period, but that's not for me to answer, that really is for him, but I think he'd, he would have responsibilities to Scotland. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, 5 million people, uh, there is no provision for any, you know, any, any, uh, any treaty provision for Scotland not to, be, uh, you know, not to be part of the European Union, and 5 million citizens... Um, I think are, are a significant part of, of, the, of, of the debate there in terms of what their rights are as, as individuals. And therefore, you know, the application of Scotland, we have been you know, members for 40 years. We have been applying uh, laws we, in terms of the ACI, in terms of the, the chapters. This committee will see volumes of material coming in on a weekly basis of transpositions of European law uh, into in, in to, to Scottish provision. Uh, so our, you know, we are very much part of the fixtures and fittings of the European Union for that not to be the case uh, because uh, you know because of the, I, don't, I don't understand the arguments he's, he's making as to how that would happen because our name is not on, on, on the tin. Uh, we are citizens as individuals and I think that's really important. I actually also want to maybe put on record um, my concerns about his argument uh, particularly um, in relation to the case he used. Um, he used a case about uh, a Mr Rotman. Um, that was a that was evidence he brought to the committee. I think this is very important to, to you know, he, that was a, a core of his argument, I think, in terms of why our citizens would suddenly uh, not, be, um, not be part of the European Union. That case, uh, Mr. Rotman was born in uh, Austria in 1956. He acquired Austrian citizenship. He became a union citizen in January 95 when Austria acceded to the EU. He applied for um, he was investigated for serious fraud, uh, subsequently examined in a court. In February 1980, he applied for residency in Munich, uh, concealing the judicial investigation in Austria. He, uh, Mr. Rotman brought an action for annulment against the decision. And the court, the judgment that was referred to by um, Alison Carmichael in his evidence, the court acknowledged that acquisition and loss of nationality is within the competence of the member state, but also that union citizenship is intended, European Union citizenship is intended to be the fundamental status of nationals of the member states. And the decision to withdraw nationality was reviewable by national courts in light of EU law to check that it is justified by a reason 
that relates to public interest and observes the principle of proportionality. And in terms of the details of this case, the reason given for withdrawal of nationality deception was a valid public interest reason, and it was for the domestic court to look at proportionality in each case. So Asa Kamaiko came to this committee and used in evidence uh, the citizenship argument a case that was one of deception. Uh, I do not think five million people who are citizens of the EU in Scotland uh, should be considered in any shape or form in, in, in the same area. So I, I think not only was it inappropriate, it was actually quite insulting to the people of Scotland that uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland came to this committee and used in evidence a case um, that was uh, dealt with on the basis of the individual's uh, uh, criminality. That's, that's quite astounding, Cabinet Secretary, but thank you very, very much for, for that. That's maybe something that the committee would wish to take up later and perhaps invite Mr Carmichael back at, at some stage, if, if at all possible. Yeah, but you could... Happy to send the details we have of that case to you. Uh, my, my last question. I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, could you tell us a wee bit more about the period between September the 19th and Independence Day? And I'm, I'm assuming that Mr Carmichael stays in his job at that, that point as, as Secretary of State, although he was a bit unsure of that himself. What, what's the nature of that relationship going to look like between the Scottish Government at that point and the UK and the U EU? Will, will we be working directly with the United Kingdom Government and asking them on our behalf to represent our, our case and so on and so forth within the European Union? Or will we be there directly with them as partners during that period, do you think? Well, what you've identified is the key importance of a good and positive relationship with the rest of the UK post-September 19th. And I go back to my point, however heated the debate will be uh, politically across in, from diff different political positions, it's really important that as, as, as governments that we behave in a responsible way um, to ensure that the, there is uh, productive and constructive relationships, particularly day one after the referendum. And we all accept the, the importance of the legitimacy of the Scottish people in their decision. Um, and so therefore, the, that, that uh, relationship, that discussion is really important um, in terms of um, how they would then uh, act, particularly in relation to the European Union at that point as well. Now, remember, uh, you know, the last thing, if you think at the end of the day, you know, there's European law and there's politics. Uh, it really will not be in the interest of David Cameron, who wants to see the rest of the UK stay in the European Union, to be facilitating a situation where one part of the British Isles, at his instigation, somehow um, is not is not going to be a part of that European Union. And so, therefore, it will be in his self-interest to make sure that that agreement and those discussions take place. We'd expect that to be done in a collective and uh, in terms of our discussions with the European Union, you know, we would want to take a key lead in that, but we recognise the, the role of the uh, UK as the member state between the period of September 19th and 2016. Yeah, that's absolutely crucial, convener and cabinet secretary, because Mr Kamichael doesn't appear to get that. Perhaps we, we might want to send him a copy of the Edinburgh Agreement. He quite clearly said on record here when, when pressed the legal obligation in the United Kingdom government is to continue to function as the United Kingdom government. Now, you could say, well, that's technically correct, but that completely ignores what, what we all understand to be within the spirit of the, the Edinburgh Agreement, that he has a duty to represent Scotland as best he can during that process as well. But there'll be lots of areas, even you know, on domestic, never mind internationally, but domestically, where there will be you know, discussions and negotiations and, and different areas. But one of the things that I think is important, and I don't know if the committee wants, will come on to, but you know, what we set out in Scotland's future is continuity of effect. Now, that's for a number of reasons. There might be advantages for us if we wanted to renegotiate everything, but we don't. We think actually it's going to be in terms of that smooth transition I talked about, in terms of the mutual self-interest of other countries as well, but also of the rest of the UK, that actually we do pursue in terms of our discussions during that 18-month period and achieve a, a situation of continuity for effect. Now, what does that mean? It means that by, we, we accept the responsibilities of the European Union, we accept the contributions to the European Union, and we, expect, uh, and we ex accept the, the payments that will need to be made. But those negotiations are within what the U UK currently has. And therefore, if we, and other countries have acknowledged this, if we can uh, resolve uh, internally within the British Isles, within that 18-month period, what that um, split in, in terms of responsibilities of contributions and assets are, then that's a much much easier place in terms of taking that forward. And I think it makes sense from lots of different points of view. And that's actually what's set out in Scotland's future. Thank you very much. Do you Gregor? Thank you, um, Mina. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, 
Polls suggest that support for EU membership in Scotland is around 53%. Um, after a yes vote, uh, and, and bearing in mind also that recent opinion polls show that a majority of Scots, about 58%, want a referendum on EU membership, um, and can I say before that that I'm very keen for Scotland to remain a member of the, the EU? Um, don't you think, like Professor Armstrong and Patrick Leyden QC, that Scots people should get the opportunity to um, say that they would like to remain in the EU? Well, I think, I think that's, uh, in, in their evidence, that's, that would be their opinion as, as to what they would prefer as opposed to what would be required. Um, and I think the committee would want to be looking at what is required as opposed to personal preferences. Um, we've set out clearly in terms of Scotland's future what people will be, um, be uh, the, the proposition that we put to the Scottish people in, in September, is that uh, you know, we as a government, the Scottish government, the Scottish National Party government, do not want us to have a, a referendum on the European Union. We don't think it's required because we believe that Scotland's best interests are served by having um, continued membership of the European Union. Why on earth would we have a referendum on something that we don't, uh, we, we don't agree with? And so therefore, I think uh, in terms of the, the real dangers, uh, you know, unfortunately, the rest of the UK and currently, if we stay and remain as part of the UK, are careering towards the exit door of the European Union in a way that I think the politicians, however much like you, David Cameron, uh, thinks we should stay within the European Union, is out with their control. And I think it's the, the responsibility of government to act in the, the best interests of its citizens. And we think that that is continuing membership of the EU. And the biggest risk to Scotland's membership of the EU would be to remain part of the Union and to, you know, and I've, I've, I've said this, and this is a political point, you know, uh, where, you know, a, a party that fails to hold its deposit in Scotland is somehow driving the political imperatives of both the Conservative Party and indeed, unfortunately, increasingly looks like the Labour Party as well. And that's not the type of Scotland that I want, our government wants. I actually don't think it's the type of Scotland, uh, you know, that the Scottish people want. And therefore, having a, uh, a referendum or even... Uh, the, the proposal to have a referendum is already having an impact on, on our interests. And it's interesting you know, when, I, when I speak to um, people in other parts of, of the world and indeed Europe, it's not the Scottish referendum that people are concerned about. The referendum that people are concerned about is the one proposed by David Cameron. It's not the Scottish government's. So it's not. Sorry, it's not the UK government's position. Yeah. But you know. I, so, so therefore, I don't think we should be uh, following the. I think the lead that's been set by David Cameron is one that is leading um, increasingly to a, a far more, uh, you know, a, a, a position where, uh, you know. The, the, he really is uh, jeopardising the, the future by, by, by holding this referendum. Well, um, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, obviously believes that giving people a choice is important. Um, and, and also, obviously, in the case of, um, you know, the, the independence referendum in, in, in Scotland as well. Uh, but, I, I mean, if Scotland becomes an independent small country, um, European states... You know, in the past have had referendums on EU membership and, and some of them, uh, well, for example Norway and Switzerland actually did vote against being members uh, and they still seem to be there both of them, doing quite well actually uh, no, no, I'll I, I, I just finish the point I would like to make though having already said that I would like personally to see Scotland remain in the European Union um, conditions for Scotland's membership may be rather different than they are under being a member of the UK. We now know that, having had taken quite a lot of evidence here. So don't you think that people should be given the choice uh, and to know what conditions they will be joining under? Well, uh, in terms of uh, membership terms in relation to uh, seats, for example, or votes, that's obviously part of the discussions that we'll have with Europe. But again, as we've set out in uh, Scotland's Future, the White Paper, in terms of issues that we've addressed, uh, we think that continuity of effect is the best way forward. Now, that means in terms of, for example, let's take the budget, 
the, the European budget and contributions, Scotland's contributions as a term for, for membership in terms of what we contribute. We think it would be in nobody's interest to reopen the budget negotiations. The multi-annual financial framework negotiations have been interminable. Uh, I, I would point out it's been small independent states that have helped steer the, fun, you know, the final resolution of the budget in, in, in Europe. But uh, those, they're set for 14, from 2014 to 2020. So therefore, uh, what we think would be the best way forward is for us to agree with the United Kingdom. It goes back to, I think, William <coughs> Coffey's point about what happens in terms of our relationship with the UK, what's agreed with them, that actually the, the budget provision, we, we would, yes, we know it would be a net contributor, but so is the, the rest of the UK, but we would agree that within the United Kingdom. Now, that's a much easier uh, transition position, not only for Scotland, but for the rest of the UK and also for the, the rest of Europe. So that's a good example of where you know, actually in terms of the continuity of effect, it makes sense for mutual self-interest for everyone for that cooperation uh, to happen during that transition period from 2014 to 2016. Mm. Uh, and, and can I just turn to the, the, the currency, the, the, the question? Um, are you, con you talked about practical solutions in your preamble. Now, um, I, I wasn't quite, I'm still not quite certain whether you think Article 49 or Article 48 or something in between is the way that Scotland is going to go forward to remain or become a member of the EU. Uh, and perhaps you could make that clear if possible. And also, uh, basically, what country, what currency will we, be, we will be using in Scotland? Will we be forced to jo join the euro? Well, um, if we maybe take the, the, the overall position, uh, I think certainly in relation to the mechanism by which we have continued membership, uh, the Scottish Government's position is we think that uh, Article 48 is the way forward. Uh, that has, again, you've had evidence from the committee that uh, that's recognised as well. Um, Article 49 is the traditional accession route. It's the Croatia route, where, some, where a country that has never been implementing uh, European legislation hasn't been a member for 40 years already and doesn't have citizens who are currently members of the European Union. That's, Article 49 is the position um, that a country like Croatia would take. That's not the position that we think that Scotland would need to take. We think, and we agree with the evidence that you've received in relation to um, Article uh, 48. Uh, I think in recognition uh, particularly of um, the evidence given by Graham Avery in particular um, uh, in, in terms of uh, his contribution. I mean, he uh, he was a uh, honorary director. He's the honorary director general of the European Commission. Uh, he wrote commission opinions on membership application of 14 countries and 19 uh, negotiation frameworks. And uh, his point that it's obvious that the common sense solution would be for Scotland's membership of the EU to be effective on the same day as its uh, independence uh, for the 5 million European citizens who have been European citizens for 40 years. And it should not be treated in the same way as people of non-member countries. And clearly, in terms of uh, the, the way forward, that would mean that the Article 48 provision that we're suggesting is the way forward. We actually set out um, in the... Uh, page 221 of Scotland's Future, both uh, the provisions for 48 and 49, but we make it clear that we think that 48 is the appropriate way uh, to go forward. Um, and so therefore, uh, that, that's the provision we support, okay, in terms of where we go, where we go from there. So therefore, in terms of, you then went on to the issue again of the terms and conditions within that. We think if we can present a continuity effect that is in the interest of other members, and particularly that would be in the interest of the rest of the UK to have a currency union, and that would mean retaining the pound. Um, I know that there's another committee of this parliament is taking evidence um, on that issue just now, and I, I thought the, the, the point made by um, uh, Professor Muscatelli very recently in the last few days about the importance of the currency union for, for both parties, then we would have that as, we would have that as a proposal yeah. going forward. Yeah. They have to join the euro then? No, no, in yeah. fact... We wouldn't Even if you go through the well, article 49... I mean, we, we, we wouldn't have to join the euro for a number of reasons. Um, and in relation, uh, for, uh, in terms of uh, membership of the, of the euro, you know, it sets out in Article 140 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, there are a number of criteria required to be satisfied by countries uh, before joining the euro area. Inflation rate, no more than 1.5 percentage points higher than three lowest inflation rate members of the EU. Governance, finance... Uh, 
annual deficit to GDP less than 3% of ratio gross debt to GDP less than 60% exchange rate. They need to, and this is an important point, applicant uh, countries, and uh, Scotland would not be an applicant country in the traditional way, uh, as in 49 and the creation route. Um, even so, it says applicant countries must have been a member of the exchange rate mechanism two for two consecutive years and should not have devalued its currency during that period. Of course, everybody knows that the membership of the exchange rate mechanism has to be voluntary. So, you know, and also there's a, a point on long-term interest rates. So actually, even using the terms of the, the, Europe, the, the euro itself, there's no, there's no reason why Scotland, in terms of the conditions, in terms of voluntary membership or any of that of the ERM, would ever be in a position that we'd have to have to uh, to 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 to, uh, to, 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 you know, to accept the euro. It's actually in the common sense position to have the currency union, but also in relation to the ERM mechanism, you know, we would not voluntarily be part of the European rate exchange mechanism, of which you have to be a member for two years, even before you meet the other criteria there. So even on that basis, I think the answer is no. Well, I know that Sweden got round it that way, but I've been told that, well, I, I understand that the Commission has since said that other countries would not be able to follow the line that Sweden did to, to do with joining the, you know, the, the excuse for not having to join the ERM first. But uh, just, okay, can I have another question, convener on this? Um, a lot of people have said, uh, including Mr. Barroso and Mr. Prodi, uh, going back to 2004, um, that d Article 49 will have to be the way because, uh, the, because Scotland would become a separate country. Now, recently the convener wrote to Vivian Redding, who was the Vice President of the European Commission, and her reply um, backed that up emphatically. Um, she said, when part of the territory of member states ceases to be part of that state, e.g. because the territory becomes an independent state, the treaties will no longer apply to that territory. Um, and under for Article 49, I'm quoting for, from her letter of the Treaty on European Union, any European state which respects the principles set out in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union may apply to become a member of the EU. So that's clearly what she thinks as well. Um, there seems to be you know, so much opinion pointing towards Article 49 that as though you say that you can use Article 48, what, when Scots actually come to vote, are they going to be in a clear position to know what, what the route is going to be? Well, they might be if the UK government uh, was cooperative and did what we, we've asked them to do, which is to present um, a position to the European Union for consideration, but the UK government have refused to do that. Um, the European Commission, uh, I remember, will not be the deciding... They, they have no decision-making in this area. Actually, it would be the Council of Ministers who would determine um, the route that would, uh, would eventually... Uh, be taken. Uh, we will be rec recommending, as indeed backed up by um, a large number of witnesses um, to this committee, that 48 is the correct route. But if we go back to the position of the European Uni Union and their uh, their views. They have not taken a, a view on Scotland because they've not been presented a view on Scotland. The correspondence you've received and the comments that have been made have been made in general and in generality, not about Scotland in particular, and not about our particular circumstances. And so therefore, I don't think that you can read into this assumption of what is required by Article 49 uh, to apply to Scotland, because that, that case has not been presented. Uh, and so therefore, much of what you're referring to in Vivian Redding's letter is actually about the creation system or creation uh, position where somebody's coming outside the European Union, not having been members for 40 years, not having citizens who have been members of the European Union for 40 years, and not having applied great suites of, of, um, of, of uh, you know, legislation uh, uh, into, their own, into their own law. And there is a point about the interests of um, the European Union. Remember, Scotland has a great deal to contribute to the European Union. In terms of the points, and I, I kind of probably missed this point in answer to Willie Coffey, you remember, you know, in terms of European citizens that live and work in Scotland, you know, we have, we reckon now over 60,000 Poles uh, living and working in Scotland for the last national census. You know, the continuity of, uh, of effect for other member states for Scotland is going to be important to them as well as, um, as, as, well as our own. So therefore, in provision, what I would say is that, you know, there are, you know, I, I think that uh, both uh, uh, 
Mr Barroso and Mr Rompuy have made political comments for political reasons. Uh, I don't think that actually is the role of the President of the European Commission to reflect on uh, the internal workings of um, any member state. And I actually think this is important to put on the record as well, if, if you can bear with me, uh, Convener and, and Mr McGregor. Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union sets out the general context within which the process of negotiating Scotland's independent EU membership will ensue. And I think it's really important to reflect uh, this, and I quote directly from it, the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality between men and women prevail. And I would expect you know, the President of the Commission and indeed Mr Terompi to reflect that actually Scotland adheres to all these points. And at a time in our democracy, in, in, in global democracy, where we have an excellent example, and I pay tribute to the UK government on this as well, we have a, a, you know, an agreed consensual a referendum where the democratic rights of the Scottish people will prevail, it is, not, uh, it is not appropriate for political comment to be made by the European Commission about that internal process of, uh, of, a, country, of a country. And I think that's what President Barroso um, mistakenly has done. And I think the backtracking since by a number of people and comments about the inappropriateness, and indeed you've had um, evidence to your uh, committee also about the inappropriateness um, of his remarks, I think um, is, is very important as well. So, you know, uh, I, I think it, these are fundamental points about the European, European Union, how people are treated. I understand that, I, but I think he's only stating what's set out in the treaties. So anybody could read what it says. And, and I mean, she's, and Mrs. Redding is just backing up that view. Well, I mean, it's not even backing up a view, it's back, backing, up, backing up what's written down. Well, at the end of the day, at the end of the day in terms of, um, you know, it talks about, uh, in her letter, when part of the territory of a member state ceases to be part of that state. That is not, um, you know, that's not we're not a, we're not part of the territory we're actually part of the the, the union that established the uk and in the, in the, in, well, sorry the union that established great britain in the first place that's a different a different context i'll let somebody else have a go <clears throat> yeah colin just wanted to you know, on that uh, the part of the uh, letter it says when part of a member state ceases to be part of a member state the treaties will no longer apply. And I think the, the point that the Cabinet Secretary is making is that the, the obligation would apply after a yes vote to seek to resolve that uh, the position of Scotland uh, before Scotland ceased to be, uh, uh, before the date of independence. So I think the points that the Commission have put forward are purely about the, uh, that, uh, that process after uh, Scotland was to uh, become independent. And I think that's where some of your evidence of those that are supporting the position of, I'm not sure we can call them Article 49ers or Article, but uh, is, is that they're taking a position that's, that from a kind of clean sheet as in outside of the, uh, outside of the UK from, from day one. Now, we're not going to be outside because for that 18-month period, we have the opportunity to have that, that, con that, that uh, continuity effect delivered and also uh, 48 uh, negotiated and delivered, and again, even you know, from an evidence timescales, that's that's also possible and doable. But this this idea, if, you, if your starting point is the Croatian position that you are physically um, and, and otherwise, you know, not not members of the European Union to start with, that's that's what she's referring to. But again, I would make my 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 overall point that you know, it's uh, there has not been a, a particular position put forward by the UK um, about this process. 49ers coming to a song called My Darling Clementine. I knew, you would, I knew you would do that. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. I'm not going to allow you to sing it, Jamie. <laughs> we're moving on, we're moving on. Alex Rowley. <laughs> yeah, good morning, Minister. I think, I mean, reading through the different different evidence, and there's, there's a lot of it, um, what I've, the conclusion I have reached is that there's a lot of experts out there, and there's a lot of expert opinion and different opinion. And we may, we may continue right up until September, um, and depending on the result, we may then find the answer in terms of Article 48 or 49. But what I do accept is that it is in Scotland's interest um, to be part of the United Kingdom. And the point you make that 
that this is quite a unique um, situation in terms of the starting point and where we come from. I think it would be acknowledged, therefore, that, that you know, other countries will be looking at this because it could set a precedent for other countries, I mean, Spain being, being one, and we accept that. So if, if we accept that one way or another we, we, we're, we're going to want to be in Europe, and whether it's through Article 40 or 49, do you accept, I think, is the evidence in even those who argue between 40 and 49 and how, how we would be in Europe, do you accept that, that they all say that there would be tough negotiations? And that if there would be tough negotiations, then it's not necessarily going to be the case that Scotland as an independent state is going to be able to win every argument. I think you talked yourself about, about tough negotiations and therefore compromise. And would you envisage, therefore, a situation where, where if there's got to be compromise, then we won't necessarily win every argument? And therefore, it may be that we do not secure the same opt-outs that we have right now when we're as, as being part of the United Kingdom. Um, I, th I, think, I, th I think you've, you've made a considered approach to the, the situation. And there are different e experts, there are different lawyers, and there are different views. And I think um, what the committee, and I pay tribute to the committee, is you, you, you have taken a very balanced approach and looked in, at different angles and different perspectives. Um, but I think you uh, made the point that, that people will seek practical solutions after uh, September the 19th, whatever their kind of, see, see, however purist they might want to be on particular legal theory and, and, and different contexts. In relation to Scotland being a, a precedent, Scotland is, I said it was a unique process in, in many different ways, but in relation, I think, to Spain in particular, and I think that's an important, an important point because People are assuming that you know different countries will and ha have said things when they haven't, and also um, you know, I make it quite clear that no country has said that they would use a veto in this process. Nobody has said that. Um, uh, the Spanish Foreign Minister Jose Manuel um, Garcia Margello uh, confirmed, and this is in the Financial Times on the 2nd of February 2014, so fairly recently. Uh, and I, I quote, uh, he confirmed that Scotland and sorry, Scotland and Catalonia are, and I quote, fundamentally different. Um, and that Scotland had no intention, and Spain had no in intention of interfering. And I quote again: uh, "We don't interfere in other countries' internal affairs. If Britain's constitutional order allows, and it seems that it does allow, Scotland to choose independence, we have nothing to say about that." Now, that's because we again comes back to our distinct process. So not only are we distinct in terms of uh, already having uh, citizen citizenship and 40 years of membership. We also have a situation, we have a consented referendum. Um, again, I think that's something, again, when I speak internationally, is recognised that the, the cooperation, the Edinburgh Agreement between the United Kingdom and the Scottish Government has been a very important part of that. So we're not a, you know, we're not, a pre I, I'm not sure that people would necessarily can say that we would be a precedent for other countries because of the process that we have taken, you know, the process that we have taken. Um, and because there's been, you know, it's quite a unique situation, we will expect um, there will have to be discussions as to the route that will take place. We recognise, and I think it's important also to recognise, we, we do recognise the role of other European countries in this process, and Article 48 and what we set out recognises the importance of, of, of their role. But then it comes back to that kind of you know, mutual self-interest of Scotland, the rest of the UK and other countries. If we were ne your point about would the, the negotiations be tough? You know, we recognise that there's a process that all negotiations have, um, you know, have different characters. And in terms of ours, you know, many of the European countries are facing big crisis and issues around you know, the eurozone in terms of unemployment, in terms of their economic growth and what they want to do. Um, if we can present them with um, a smooth transition that has been agreed, much of it agreed internally between you know, the United, rest of the United Kingdom and Scotland during that 18-month period, that will be to their benefit as well. Um, if we were negotiating every single point, then I think your point is well made. If we were somehow going to be you know, every, you know, whether it's you know, contribution, whether it's um, different aspects of uh, un unpicking uh, all the different parts of European membership, then I think you, you would have a point. But we're not. And that's why the idea of the continuity of effect, that we would inherit the positions that the UK has, 
and we would make our contributions in that basis. So, for example, my, my example is the budget, not reopening the budget, would actually be of everybody's self-interest. But the, you know, Scotland becoming an independent state and therefore a, a new state within Europe, that the other 28 states would have to sign up to that. And therefore, do you accept that th there would have to be negotiations? Or are you saying that they would just accept everything that was put forward and that there would, you know, there would be no need for compromise? Would, everything, everything that's in place right now for the UK would be in place and the other 28 states would just sign up to that? Well, if, if you had a situation in, in relation to 48, you know, we've set out that there would be a role for the other um, you know, the 28 members. We recognise that. But actually, in terms of uh, presenting a continu that continuity of effect in terms of the provision, that means we are a net contributor. We're not, you know, we're, we're, you know in terms of um, other areas where it would be in the interest of, of other countries um, you know, to get an advantage, then, you know, the, the issue is the risks to them of not having Scotland is a big one. Now, you know, let's take, let's take fishing, for example, in relation to the amount of um, investment that they have and, and, and their self-interest in where we are. And there's, in terms of the other countries in relation to their uh, interests, it's very extensive. So we've got something in relation to, I've got a figure here, uh, other countries' investment. I think it's in terms of figure, I'll give it to you. Uh, our, our, in terms of the provision, here we go. Uh, Scotland's fishing zone makes up 61% of the entire UK zone and has an industry that holds approximately 70% of all the UK quota of key stocks and a fleet accounting for 60% of, of tonnage. And in relation, uh, in relation to this, we also have uh, a huge amount of financial interest of other countries in Scotland, as in what's, you know, what's taken out of Scotland's waters. Now, we're not suggesting um, that there should be a hiatus in this. In fact, going back to that point, we think it's in everyone's interest that there isn't. But it becomes in the interest of other countries for there not to be a hiatus. It comes in their interest because in relation to our negotiations about fishing zones, in relation to, for example, access to Norwegian waters, never mind Scottish waters, and if you combine Norwegian waters and Scottish waters, there's a big self-interest in, in the fishing fleets of other countries to continue to have uninterrupted access to that. So therefore, there's an imperative from a time scale. So you, I, mean, I know as a leader of council, you've been involved in different negotiations at different times, and there are risks on all sides to everybody. So there's going to be an imperative for, for them to resolve this in a time scale that means that pulling out uh, extended negotiations for self-interest on one issue would prevent that. So. I'm just trying to get to this point where we're, we're trying to look at what is, what is the implications of Scotland becoming an independent state in its negotiations in terms of Europe and whether, I mean, Schengen, for example, I mean, you know, the, a practical approach to that would be it would seem mad that we would end up having no border controls with the rest of Europe, but having to put border controls up with England. And within the UK, so no, nobody seriously thinks yeah. that, that that might happen, although it would have to be negotiated. Um, in terms of the, 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 um, the, the current financial arrangements with the UK and the UK rebate, um, it would have to be negotiated. And what I'm saying to you really at the end of the day is, do you believe that, that during those negotiations that, that we as an independent state will simply um, get agreement on everything and we will be there on the same terms as the UK is currently there? Or do you believe that there will have to be compromise? Uh, I don't believe there needs to be compromise because it will be in every self-interest um, that we have the same, that have the same terms. Now, why is that and why would that be the case? Going back to the budget uh, negotiations that have now been settled, by 2016, approximately, and I'll correct this if it's the wrong figure, 85% of the funding arrangements will have been agreed and negotiated and in place. And that's, you know, and this committee will have spent a lot of time in this and structural funds um, and also on, on CAP. Now, why, why, would, why would we want to disrupt that? Now, in terms of, of CAP, we know that we've been given a, a poor deal and you know, the Scottish Parliament collectively, cross-party, has said, look, you know, Scotland is going to have the lowest figure, um, you know, hectare um, uh, figure of any, any of the European countries. Now, you know, that, that, is, problem, that is problematic. Now, were we to reopen absolutely everything, 
um, then that would mean that there would be changes at that point, and you know we would, you know, we might want to negotiate separately on that. What we're saying and what we're setting out is in every self-interest that we don't try and renegotiate the whole of the multi-annual financial framework, of which you know structural funds and cap are, are a huge, a huge so element. The first minister is that that we will be in Europe, we will be a member of Europe, and we will be there on exactly the same agreements, conditions, terms, as we are now as part of we the think, UK. We, we think that will be in the interest not only of uh, Scotland, but also the rest okay. of the UK and also um, the, the rest of Europe in terms of, the in, in terms of making sure that we have that um, agreement in place, for, uh, which is in every's interest for that continuity of membership at the point of, of independence. And I, I, I'll maybe go back to the point about Schengen. You know, we, can, we can accept the kind of <coughs> principles of Schengen, but the practicalities, as you well set out, is that actually it makes sense, as long as the rest of the UK and Ireland are not part of uh, Schengen, that the common travel area is, is, the, is the appropriate way forward. It's, a, it's, it's common sense and, and practical. Uh, and you know, again, I can't see that being a major, you know, point. We're, we're not objecting to the principles of what the UK, what the rest of the Europe are trying to do in terms of Schengen, but it's not appropriate for us at this time, and, and so therefore we acknowledge that. You, you mentioned in your um, <coughs> your introduction, your conversation, you mentioned the Labour Party position in terms of referendum. Um, which is my understanding the Labour Party position is, Maybe is, it is, that, is that if there were more powers to go from, from um, Britain to Europe, then there would be a referendum. Um, and really, that same position I, I would put to you, if, if Scotland is going to lose more powers, so if Edinburgh, having taken powers for London, as it were, for the UK, um, as an independent state, are going to um, lose powers to, to Europe or transfer powers to Europe. Is there any circumstances where you would see that the Scottish people would be entitled to have a say on what powers should remain within Scotland or what powers should be transferred to Europe? Uh, the, the different elements to that, and I think I see where you're, see where you're trying to go with this. Um, uh, in terms of membership, there has been no situation um, that there's been a requirement for a referendum on membership of another country um, in the European Union. In terms of um, the continuity, I think so Jim, Cur Jim Curry gave evidence to you, uh, former European Commission Director General for Environment. I, am, I, quote, I do not think that others would see the necessity for everything to change overnight in terms of the opt-outs that the UK currently has, uh, not at all. So that's evidence that you have from somebody who's obviously been at the heart um, of the Commission in that area. And in relation to um, reform and uh, uh, refor the, the reform agenda and the change in the balance of power and, and indeed subsidiarity and other ele elements between uh, the European Union and Scotland as a member state. We do think there needs to be reform and we do think there needs to be improvements. Where we disagree with the UK is that this would require uh, treaty change Okay, and actually, if there is a flow of powers, I think everybody, and that's and I talk to other you know um, European governments as well, is it will be the other way around. It will be, and it's not just the you know the UK government are obviously trying to make this as a, a key a key part of their their argument for an in out referendum, but actually the reform agenda is on everybody's agenda. You know, and we've even from Scotland, we have already, as part of our constructive and progressive approach to this, produced. Um, a, a paper on priorities for reform. Now, the difference is, and this is the point about does it require a referendum or not, we don't think that changes um, that we're suggesting and the improvements that we're making would require treaty change itself. Um, there are issues in some countries, obviously, treaty change would require referendum in, in relation to transfer of powers. Um, we don't think that in terms of what happens within the UK would be in that territory. Now, if you look, and I'm sure the committee at some point will, the, the balance of competences review that's being led by the UK government, and we've looked very closely at what has been produced to date, there's nothing in the first semesters, we think, nothing in th those semesters of the competencies review that the UK government is in. Remember, this is going to be the basis of what David Cameron is going to say, he wants to negotiate treaty, you know, new treaties or a new package and all the rest of it. We don't think there's anything to date that would require a treaty, a new treaty, or you know, we think it can all be done within amendments to existing 
treaties. Now, that's a trigger for many, you know, that would be the trigger many would argue for if there, if there had to be, um, you know, some kind of referendum, etc. And that's the case that David Cameron is currently making. I think he's, he's probably failing to date on that. Now, I'm not saying in terms of the next chapters or the next semesters of the competency review, they'll find something that would require that kind of change. But to date, and I've asked that question, they haven't done that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just finish on this, this, this point. It's, it's the point I'm really making is not so much David Cameron, and I, I, do, I do believe, by the way, that, that the case will be put um, and there will be a, a, a vote if David Cameron does go back in, there would be a vote to stay within Europe. But just to come back, because you mentioned the, the, the evidence given by Jen Curry, and that's, that's where I'm really trying to come to. That's where I'm really trying to get to in terms of people in Scotland looking at this right now and saying, right, if we, if we vote yes and we have an independent Scotland, will we have you know, a different relationship with Europe? And, and what would that mean? And, and the evidence that, that Jim Curry gave, he states quite clearly, an independent Scotland's membership would not simply involve a seamless move to the EU. Tough negotiations would resolve, revolve around a number of things, especially the opt-outs the UK has. Schengen opt-out, the budget abatement, the opt-out from justice and security measures. I think there would be tough negotiations. But what you've seemed to have said to the questions I've asked you is that there may well be tough negotiations, but at the end of the day, we will continue with these opt-outs. Well, I think we, we, we can and we, and we should. Uh, in terms of that's the case, you know, that's the case that we're, we're presenting in Scotland's future. That, in terms of that continuity of effect, is in everybody's interest. It's the overall continuity of effect that's in everybody's interest, of which some of those elements, you know, you've just described. If you were to do, uh, if you were to do a case by case on every different issue negotiation on everything, and that includes the budget as well, and all the structural funds and cap, and you name it, that's not in anybody's self-interest to do that. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think we're going to be in that place. I don't think it's anybody's interest for us to be in that place. Um, you know, so that's, again, um, you know, that I think you've got enough evidence from ourselves and, and, and what's been set out in the papers as, as to the route forward. But it's, it's the, you know, the European Union has been built on, you know, um, you know, I, I, you know find, finding political routes to solutions. And, you know, in terms of the attractiveness of a good cooperative, a positive uh, you know, a country that's positive about its uh, European membership. I think that's a, an asset to the European Union and they'd want to make sure that that, that, that continues. It's in their interest for that to continue as well. Um, and I suppose that's kind of you know, the point about um, the different, how you're going to, I mean, I'd be interested how you're going to be able to, to use all the different evidence that, that, that you've come across because you really have got into some of the kind of key issues and recognise that. Um, but I, I think it's in a mutual self interest for us to have that continuity of effect, and that's why uh, we've set that out. But I think it's an important point to raise in terms of what those negotiations might look like. Um, but, you know, again, in terms of the evidence, uh, you know, that. that the kind of uh, you know, responsible attitude of both governments on September the 19th, should there be a yes vote, is probably key to this. And I think whatever the climate of disagreement we will have over the next period in terms of political debate, it's really important. And I think people would expect that from the government and indeed the parliament when they come to that position as well. Ed Adamson. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Actually, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned many of the things I wanted to, to bring uh, to the committee today. But... Um, Given that one of the, um, the witnesses described the idea of a hole in the European Union for any length of time as being a nightmare scenario in terms of, you know, what might happen post-independence and how um, how difficult that would be for, for both, not, not just Scotland, but for other European nations whose nationals and who are here and whose businesses are here. Um, and given you also mentioned the, the ACI and the fact that Scotland is in a position where we... we um, conform to the ACI and we would have relevant institutional, regulatory and administrative structures in place post-independence. I find it quite disturbing that when the Scottish Government position is arguing one of continuity effect with no detriment to other European states, we'll continue to be an contributor to the EU, um, that Mr Carmichael described that post his evidence to this committee as um, something that would be a difficult protracted process for Scotland, and yet at the same time, with no indication of what the renegotiation terms of the relationship with the EU might be at a UK level, we're expected to believe that Mr Cameron can achieve 
a major renegotiation of terms in a similar timescale, and that is presented as being reasonable, but somehow Scotland's position is untenable. Would you, would you like to comment on that? I think, that, I think that's a very interesting way of, of looking at it. I, I must say it's not one that I had uh, thought of, but I, I think it is an interesting, um, you know, compare and contrast. And, you know, that's what, that's what governments do, is they, they discuss and they, they find a... A way forward, and that's what we—that's what we will expect to do. And in terms of preparation, probably, in, uh, you know, in, in terms of preparation, Scotland will be one of the most prepared countries ever um, to be in a position of going into independence. And also, not only that, we've got the transition period of 18 months thereafter um, to make sure, uh, obviously, this domestically, but internationally, um, the different areas can all be dealt with. You know, it's. Uh, it's you know, we're not trying to say that everything, you know, it's, I think the point to Alec Rowley, we're not trying to pretend that there won't be discussions and negotiations and, you know, people have clear interest in this. But I think if people approach it in a, in a way that they want to get constructive resolution, it can be achieved. And why do we know that? Because that's happened in many other, other places before. I thought in terms of the evidence about, um, uh, I think it was Graham Avery on Finland was quite interesting. Um, and the point that he thinks in that, in that time, that time scale, it was probably about 12 months in relation to the actual negotiations that took place. Now, that was, again, from a country that wasn't a, already applying much of European law, that wasn't already uh, had citizens. Um, and I think that was an, interest, an, an interesting uh, reference as well. But I, I, I think it's... I know you've made the, you know, the, the analogy between the, the two points. I, I think it's quite important that we keep them quite separate, and it's one of the things I'm quite uh, keen to do in terms of my discussions with uh, other governments as well, is because the period of what... if Should there be another... I mean, I also make it clear that it's not, the in-out referendum is not the UK government's position, it's... It's the position of David Cameron, should he be re-elected uh, as Prime Minister, um, as one part of the coalition government. And, you know, that period will be much later than, than ours, and we would not want to have a conflation between the negotiations that David Cameron may want to have as part of um, his in-out referendum renegotiation package conflated in any shape or form with what we would be doing in terms of our provision, which would be much earlier, would be taking place between 14 and 16. Um, and actually, it was in every interest to do that you know, uh, as, as early as possible, that we are not going to be you know, expecting those two those two issues to be conflated in any way. So as much as I'm interested in your comparison analogy, um, I, I think it's going to be in our, our interest to make sure that other countries are quite clear that these are two separate and distinct processes. Um, obviously, um, it's a choice of two futures going forward for the Scottish people, and um, uh, they, they have the, the two futures for Europe to consider as well, what might happen, uh, depending... On, on both elections, um, and is, the, is, there, is there an opportunity in a Scottish constitution post-independence to maybe um, include opportunities for referendum on these very issues? And could you maybe comment on what opportunities a Scottish constitution could give to um, deciding these in the future? Uh, well. Uh, and clearly, in terms of a written constitution for, for Scotland, that would be a first because we currently don't have one, um, and that's why it's quite interesting that any the suggestions I think um, uh, from others that somehow you could, under the current arrangement, protect, enshrine, or protect the power, even the kind of powers of this Parliament without a written constitution is I think very challenging indeed. So therefore, I mean, one I, I think it's really important that we do. Most countries, it's the norm to have a, a written constitution. The content of that, you know, and this is where um, you know, we, we've set out a number of things in, in Scotland which we, we think should be in that written constitution. But I, I firmly believe that the written constitution should be written not by me, not by this committee or by Parliament. I think it should be written collectively with the people of Scotland as to what they will want in there or not want in there. And that includes um, how, whether there are referendums in the future, either for domestic issues or indeed for international issues. So I think it's really important that um, although we want to give as much certainty and as much content of what an independent Scotland would look like, and we've done that in a whole variety of different areas, and the committee scrutinising that and in different committees, um, that, that in particular is one of the issues that I think is would quite rightly be the subject of discussion by a convention that's brought together to, to shape that. 
I think that document is going to be the most exciting document I think we will have as a country because the interesting part of it, although we'll be going into the referendum in September with the Scottish Government's view of what should happen, and that's our view, we're trying to do it as, as uh, representing the people of Scotland as possible, that's going to be the time when all of us, regardless of our political party, and that would include Alistair Carmichael and, and everybody uh, from other parties, um, that's going to be one of the first documents that will be done by everybody, and I think that's really symbolic and important. Um, that, that that does happen because you know, I, I, I come back to this point is we will have our disagreements and we will have them in the chamber and we'll have them in debates up until September the 19th but what is going to be really exciting after September the 19th is when we can harness even all these different legal opinions in terms of you know legal roots etc just think about the you know one thing I hope you've managed to find is like you know, in terms of inquiry I mean the, the real uh, talent and the real experience that we have in Scotland at lots of different levels that will help shape that new country and I think the first evidence of that will be the constitution but uh, as far as you know what will be in terms of referendum that will be for the people of Scotland to decide as it will be for the people of Scotland to decide which government they will elect in 2016. Malik. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, I've been listening to you very patiently for over an hour, and I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen uh, almost everything re-rehearsed. You talk about, and nobody said that they would veto our membership to European Union, but we've not also had any guarantees from anybody that they won't. Uh, you talk about Ireland. I can give you an example of Turkey. You, you say that, you know, 48 would be the best way forward for our negotiations. Some people say it's 49. There's no clarity there. What have you brought that's new to us today? Well, um, in terms of, of the evidence, uh, I'm coming uh, at the end of your evidence uh, session. I think you heard from the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, at the beginning of your evidence session. And uh, I'm reflecting on the evidence that you have, have received. I think it's in the interest of the committee to do that. Uh, why do I not need to bring in anything new? Because it's in Scotland's future in terms of, of, of our proposals and it's in Scotland and the European Union and it's in the document I've also provided the committee on our priorities for reform. So, you know, I, I know that you're, you, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what it is that you're looking for, but I have provided a wealth of information to this committee um, over the last few weeks and, and, and also going back to last year in terms of our you know, provisions. So, uh, you know, I, I think the evidence is... I th the important thing, actually, is the evidence is there. Uh, we've made our case, and we will continue to make our case. Uh, that's exactly the point I'm trying to make, is that the, the, the evidence is not clear, even today. Uh, the, the, there are still huge gaps and expectations of, of others. And what concerns me is when we have expectations of others and they fail to deliver it will affect me as a Scot. So, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, opt-outs, in terms of assurances, in, top, in terms of how long it would take to negotiate entry into Europe, uh, in terms of our currency, nothing, and I repeat, nothing has been guaranteed to us at this stage. And nothing, if, will, if, be, yeah, and nothing will be you, guaranteed with a no vote should David Cameron present a referendum on in out. Nothing can be guaranteed as to whether Scottish well, companies will still be giving, able to, to have the at same. At least he's giving an option to citizens to vote in well, right for Europe. <laughs> you, you can't have the it both Scottish ways. government <laughs> isn't even doing that. We are, assuming, we are assuming that Scotland will want to be part of Europe if Scotland becomes independent. We are not actually asking. Well, and giving the people an opportunity to give us what they would like. Well, the, re the reality is that there is a choice of two futures facing the Scottish people. There will be certainties and uncertainties on whether you vote yes or whether you vote no. Um, I think increasingly in terms of um, the, the rest of the UK's position on Europe, I've got real concerns that the, the referendum on the in-out uh, in -out membership uh, that's been proposed by David Cameron is you know, leaving a situation where, you know, we're careering towards a potential exit, and I think that is not in MD's interest. And I acknowledge that David Cameron doesn't want us to uh, to leave the, the EU, and David McGregor set his record and, and others as well. But that, that's they have they, they have opened uh, uh, you know they've opened a door which I'm not sure they'll be able to, to close. And in terms of, of um, membership, I maybe reflect the, the two latest polls that I'm aware of. Um, uh, in terms of me EU membership in England um, in November, there was a poll that basically said 
42% would want to stay and 50% would want to leave. Um, the most recent poll that I'm aware of in Scotland is in February, where it said that 53% wanted to stay, to, to, to stay and only 34% wanted to leave. So there is a, a, a difference of, of, of opinion in that. But, you know, we don't know what the tax rate of a UK will be in five years' time. We do not know... Um, in, in relation to European membership, whether we'll be there or not. And Alistair Kamiko himself, as the Secretary of State, said there's no guarantees that the UK will be, you know, be a member at the end of this decade. So, you know, there are, as a politicians, we know that there are certainties and uncertainties in, in, in all of this. Now, we've set out as much as we can. Now, I, I can tell you, some of these things that you're asking to be guaranteed could, could be guaranteed if the UK government had those discussions now with us and I no, think that's that, what a lot of people are concerned about it's not it's not it's not because we it's not because of um, from our it's not because we don't want to give you those again we would like to give you those guarantees but if the UK government refuses to have those discussions before the referendum there's actually very little we can do about it but I think that was a question that probably could and should have been given to Alistair Carmichael as a representative of the UK government never mind the cooperation you know from the, from the cooperation point of view I know these do it's, it's tactical they don't want to seem to do pre-negotiation but actually in terms of you know, even to do that um, in, in relation to some of those issues that people are expecting, um, and you know, they, they, they can and should do that, and, and, that, and that's the problem. This is where, why I wanted to come on to the Edinburgh Agreement, and um, one of my colleagues is, uh, has been insisting that the British government has a legal obligation to support and assist Scotland in that, in that transfer period. And the question I want to ask is, which I don't believe has been asked to date, is, what if they decide not to support and assist us? What can we do about it? Well, you know, they'll be facing a Westminster election uh, shortly thereafter, and you know, I think in the, there's a political imperative that would lead them to to, to to need and want to do that. But also, I think in a sense, of, you know, it's mutual self in, it's the mutual self interest uh, that will kick in. I mean, it, it absolutely will be, and that's you know, in, in terms of, of their own provision, because they, they don't want to turn around, you know, just as they're heading into a Westminster election, and um, talking to all their. You know, to, to their business interests and employers saying that, you know, by the way, um, because of our non-cooperation, we're going to hike up your charges and costs for doing businesses in terms of transaction or anything else. That is not in their interest to do that going into a Westminster election. So, you know, there's a, there's a quite, I think there's a, a kind of real politic check here as to what will happen immediately after uh, the yes vote that is in mutual self-interest in this. And, you know, I, I think that's kind of... You know, accept accept the you know the Edinburgh Agreement with the spirit and indeed the content that it was set out. I don't think it's for us to second guess um, and say that they're going to renege on the Edinburgh Agreement. I don't believe they will because I do think that the uh, the David Cameron signed that in good faith and cooperation. And remember, he himself said that he would support Scotland's membership of the EU. He, has on, he is on the record as saying that, and he said that very recently in an interview when he came to Scotland. Just to finish off, I know you've got a flight oh, to catch, so I'll, I'll just finish off by saying that whilst I don't believe we, we've got anything new from you today, but it was, it, the discussion was nevertheless helpful. But I, I think I just, I just want to point out that there are still very clear difficulties ahead. And I think and this is why it's important that we try and tease out what we can from what we can't. And I think that's the important challenge for us collectively. Uh, and, and I wish all of us well in trying to do that. Yeah, yes, I do. And I think this, this committee will be an important part of that, that process, not just um, in now in the inquiries you've got, but you know, that you, you, this committee will have a great deal of responsibility um, immediately after September in the vote as well. I know that you've really, really pushed for time. I've got a very quick final question from Rod Campbell, but we could write to you on it if that would... Yep. Okay. Uh, well, I had a number of questions, but I'll just restrict it to, to one as we've got limited time. <laughs> okay. Just following on this fifth question of uh, Hamzala and the Edinburgh Agreement, Edinburgh Agreement says no pre-negotiations, that somehow or other we seem to have a position on the currency, uh, which some people might say is pre-negotiation. Would you like to comment on that? I think, I think it's politics. I think it's politics and people don't believe uh, George Osborne's uh, comments on this because they, you know, they recognise it for 
um, the, the bluster it is, uh, and actually the self-interest, again, it comes down to mutual self-interest. The currency union will be in the mutual self-interest of, of, of both, uh, and I think they've made a, a tactical mistake and a tactical blunder on that, and I think it's unravelling as we speak, and in terms of the, the, the references that even if a, a UK minister, an unnamed UK minister, uh, doesn't believe what George Osborne says, why on earth should the rest the rest of the people of Scotland. But perhaps that's for the other committee that's looking at these things to, to, to look at. Okay, uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much. I think, uh, as we've done with all of our witnesses, we've generally came back to them with some additional questions, and I hope you don't mind if we, if we actually, the, the sum of our conversation later this morning results in some more questions coming back to you um, on any of the aspects of the, the committee inquiry. Um, can we thank you very much for your evidence today? Um, I think we appreciate very much and, and wish you a safe trip. Thank you. I'm going to suspend briefly just to allow the witnesses to change over.